So good morning, everybody. I appreciate Jack's introduction. As he mentioned, I am the CEO of First Priority Global. We are a multinational company specializing in uh, transportation-related uh, uh, clean energy uh, solutions. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here in Stanford today, and I'd like to thank SunPower for uh, having us to share some of our recent experiences in uh, uh, initiatives for clean energy transportation. I've learned a lot today. Um, first of all, the big surprise was I was pleased to hear that I won the award for coming the most distance. And uh, Jack has asked me to see Bruce afterwards to give my home address for my free sun power, a solar array for my home. That was a very, very nice surprise, Bruce. It touched my, touched my heart. Uh, I was interested to hear uh, Bill Kelly's comments earlier when he talked about changing the way the world is powered. So in some small way, our mission is to change the way the world uses that power. How, do, how is it used effectively, particularly in our, our uh, focus for today in the school element, transporting school children? Um, it's, our story is how do we get from red to yellow to green? So basically, as mentioned, I'm a firefighter paramedic since I was 15 years old. Uh, how does that relate to school buses and how does that relate to green energy? Well, it's pretty simple. First of all, I'm an East Coast guy. And what many of you may not know is that there are many innovations, even in our emergency services industry, that started in California. I'll age myself and talk about the 1970s and a very famous television show called Emergency. Some of you may have seen it with Johnny and Roy with the little red truck and Dixie McCall and uh, my first crush in, in, uh, as a young man. Uh, but basically, that transformed emergency medical care in our country because it showed how uh, these progressive programs were happening in California and what was available to the rest of the rest of the country. So uh, I've learned through our multinational business how interconnected we really are. So on the West Coast, how are we affected by the pollution levels on the East, and, I'm sorry, on the East Coast, how are we affected by the air that comes all the way across the country? Um, my firefighting career was cut short uh, when I was exposed to toxic chemicals at a fire and uh, basically uh, some six months later couldn't be in a room with a cigarette anymore. Not very consistent with being a firefighter. But I had wonderful life experiences I learned. When people put their lives in your hands, it is a once in a lifetime situation. There's nothing closer to God than delivering a baby or rescuing somebody from a burning building. But what's the next closest thing to that? When people entrust us with their school children, right? The people in the room here who shape their future or their, or their inspirations are guys like John Clemens, the electric school bus evangelist, who is out every day of his life promoting how to, how to transport children safely and do it in an environmentally friendly way. I'm very proud to come from a, a heritage of, of heroes, people you sit across from the day. And unfortunately, in our society, that term is pretty widely used. You can go on MTV and see someone half naked covered with gold chains, and they're a hero to somebody. What I was really impressed with was to hear that the commissioner had won an award as a Clean Air Hero Award. Well, that's really special. You know, really forward thinking to how his role as a hero changes the life quality of, of, of people here in California. So in some small way, we're really looking forward to being a part of that. And our company is steeped in a philosophy of economic viability. We have employees to pay. It's, it's not a dirty word in America to say you make a profit, but a social responsibility component that we can be economically successful and give back to our community. And to me, that goes to the roots of, of my heritage, is to be able to give back to the community and do good things. And, and something that I do miss not being a firefighter anymore, but it's why this is an exciting business. And, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about um, a project that uh, started here in California for electric school buses, and then talk a little bit about how, uh, how that is available to you to impact your communities. Um, so Kings County, uh, Kings Canyon was one of the first projects that we did. Um, pretty simple statistics. Uh, the slide speaks to the topic of it transports 5,500 students a day, covers 800,000 miles. Uh, the annual fuel costs were $360,000 the annual maintenance cost of uh, $1.2 million. Oops, I'm sorry, am I going the wrong way? Okay, thank you. 
Uh, I, I have to admit that in my uh, earning my graduate degree, I thought I would take the easy way out. Um, it was uh, my last course that I took was uh, computer science, which was very foreign to a firefighter. And we saw the big IBM with the punch card machine. So of course, I, so of course, I did the smart thing, paid my paid my classmate a hundred bucks to help get me through the course. So today, my wife tells me I'm a whiteout guy in a laptop world. So, so you have to excuse me if I don't quite always know how to get these slides to the next level. I think it's uh, the revenge, the revenge of our, my teachers. So basically, the economics that drive um, the consideration of environmentally friendly vehicles is pretty compelling. Uh, you compare the annual cost of diesel fuel, uh, both in terms of the fuel itself, how many days a year it runs, and you come up with a pretty simple calculation. It's about $51.84 per day. When you go to the right, it speaks to the topic of how that uh, while electric vehicles are uh, capital intensive, the operating profile is dropped dramatically. You can see that the simple calculation is you can drop to $3.89 per day in terms of operating efficiency, operating cost. And that's because in electric vehicles in particular, you have the dramatic drop in maintenance. Think about you don't have oil, you don't have fuel filters, you don't have transmission maintenance, things of these nature. The brake life is much longer. So it is a, an operating, uh, operating benefit. The parts and labor associated with it, again, are, are, much, are much smaller. The projected savings uh, are pretty, uh, pretty significant. Again, $9,000 a year in savings on fuel, uh, $3,000 a year savings on maintenance. And over the lifestyle of the bus, the lifespan of the bus, uh, it can be up to $180,000 variance in operating if you look at it as a 15-year 15 uh, 15 uh, return on investment. California is unique. It's one of the states that d does not have a lifespan uh, law. So in New Jersey, for example, our school buses have to come off the road uh, in 12 years. Uh, John tells me there's a uh, 1950-era crown. You may all remember that old that crown bus, buses made in here that are still on the road. Uh, we were very fortunate that we represent some advanced technology in the bus end of the business. And uh, you'll, the, those of you who will partake, uh, partake in the tour this afternoon will see that the, the Lion bus is an all-composite body. So while rust is not as big a concern on the West Coast as it is on the East Coast, it, is a, it will have a very long life cycle. Uh, so if you have buses that can last 20, 30 years, you could really look at spreading out the, uh, the, your cost of the uh, capital investment. There's a number of grant programs available in addition to uh, financing programs such as Lance can offer that helps reduce the capital uh, intensive nature of electric versus uh, standard fuel vehicles. Uh, it ranges anywhere from 110,000 for uh, class A buses to, uh, I'm sorry, $110,000 for type A's to so $130,000 for uh, type C buses. Uh, the process is becoming much more streamlined uh, and in the, we've just recently been am amongst a number of participants uh, vying for the ARB grants. And where we differentiate ourselves is working with the school districts to identify the whole spectrum of solution. So our ARB grants included not just the buses, but the infrastructure. Think about you've got to have the ability to plug the buses in the charge and sufficient uh, electrical capability to do that was uh, charging systems, uh, training, maintenance, the whole spectrum. And that's really where the industry needs to go. One of the challenges about electric vehicles has been um, my description of it as the pet rock. Everybody's got the newest idea, premature to market, horrendous aftermarket service, and it's just really designed to, to attract investment capital. And this is a venture capital driven world, unfortunately. We, our culture, frankly, is you know coming from the world of the fire service and coming from the world of public safety is there is such a high degree of criticality and the dependability of the types of equipment that we provide, that we're bringing that culture to the environmentally friendly fleets. I can tell you that uh, when I sell a, an aerial device to a fire chief for $1.2 million, on Christmas morning at 4 o'clock, if that thing gets stuck in the air, you can bet my guy's going to be there at 4.30 to help fix the truck. Uh, I was in a meeting with Frito-Lay not long ago, and he asked me whether we thought we could do better than waiting for a year 
for a part that he's had on order from one of, from one of our competitors. You know, so for my culture is my, our response time, you know, comes from an industry measured in minutes. And for here, customers say that, you know, could we do better than a year? You know, I would tell you that the culture of first priority is, is an absolute yes, that that's, that is what we bring to the market. This is just, some, again, some additional comparators about how long your return of investment takes uh, versus the capital, the capital uh, uh, intensive nature of electric vehicles in particular. Um, and there's a projection that shows that the, uh, the payback is achieved in about six years. This varies by region, it varies by type. We also offer CNG and propane solutions depending on the, the nature of your uh, rural or uh, city uh, structure. Uh, where your resource availability drives a lot of those decisions. So here's the real topic. Uh, back in December, there was a wonderful op-ed piece in the New York Times, and it basically said, stop killing our school children with dirty school buses. And it is a really poorly known fact in terms of the impact on children's health with this diesel particulate. Here's the simple fireman comparison. You cannot go into a, a municipally staffed firehouse in California where you're allowed to start the fire truck in the building. Every single fire truck will have an exhaust uh, system that basically that takes the exhaust out of the, out of the, out of the uh, firehouse because of the high level of carcinogens associated with diesel particulate. But go into any, almost any diesel powered school bus in your district and run your finger down the window and you're gonna come up with a finger full of soot. It's just the reality of, think about the amount of idle time associated with these buses. Think about when you have the routes, when the kids get out of school, and all these buses are stacked up behind each other. Where's all that exhaust going? There was a study in New Jersey done recently that actually talked about the one school study was a pattern of the school buses being staged out front right underneath the exhaust intake for the HVAC system for the school. So what they were basically doing is they were exhausting the buses right into the school. So it's really, you know, I unfortunately um, have a, a strong view of some of this. Uh, the, my retirement gift from the fire service was asthma. Uh, and it's just nature of the beast. Um, but I traveled to China in one of, my, uh, one of our trips, and I was there on the most, uh, the highest air polluted day in the history of the country. And I w uh, was there less than 18 hours and came home with pneumonia. Uh, because, uh, and that happened to be in an area where I had had a collapsed lung from, from a, an injured, uh, I was trapped on a roof at a fire at a young age and I had a section of collapsed lung. But it really drives home the point of what people live with with these air pollution days. But the statistics here are really scary. When you look at the fact that children's exposure is four times greater than riding in a car. You think of asthma, lung disease, uh, heart disease, 46 times greater risk to develop cancer because of the fact of them having to go to school on a, on a diesel school bus. It's pretty scary. Um, this one to me was amazing, that on a given day, the cumulative exhaust inhaled by the 40 or so children on a self-polluting bus is comparable to, or in many cases larger than, the cumulative amount of exhaust inhaled by all the people in the South Coast Air Basin. Doesn't seem feasible, but these are statistics that are, that are real and are really becoming much better known. So, but these are things that we can impact. So what does the future hold? One of the things that we're very excited about and we're in some discussions with Sun Power as a good, as a, as a, in a partnering perspective is the topic of V to G. So school buses are really rolling battery packs and the they're charged during low usage rate, low cost rate ends of the spectrum. They're used very little, a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the afternoon, and go back to their base with a tremendous load in their battery pack. So the future is the ability to develop two-way um, pathways for electricity to both go in and charge the vehicle, but then at night, when the co or during peak power times, is for that energy to be sold back to the grid in some usable for portion. So it's not just uh, a, an economically viable opportunity to help reduce the CapEx cost of the bus, but also offer grid stabilization. In New Jersey, I was, of course, 
uh, part of our state was really terribly affected by Hurricane Sandy. You know, we don't have hurricanes in New Jersey, and they don't come in the in the winter time. In particular, you know, uh, we had uh, uh, three days after Hurricane Sandy hit, we had snow. We had in these big disaster relief centers, we had 8,000 cases of hypothermia. Because why? Well, disaster response to hurricanes happen in warm weather areas. So there's a lot of lessons learned. But one of our biggest problems was we couldn't get, we ran out of gasoline. Why? There's no electricity to power the gas stations. So even in disaster response, school buses and heavy commercial vehicles have great opportunity to provide stored energy back to the grid to give us some disaster response capability. So, it's, uh, so it has many, many levels that we're excited about. One thing I, I noticed when the commissioner made his presentation this morning, he had a slide that talked about transit buses, and he talked about motor scooters, and talked about the heritage of these things being built in California. First Priority Global has recently acquired electric vehicles, uh, Electric Vehicles International up in Stockton, and it's going to deal with the commercial end of the business. Class 8 trucks uh, support our school bus initiatives all across the way to, to help bring to California commercially viable electric vehicles across a much broader spectrum. And in the same way I spoke about earlier, how the West Coast affects the East Coast, some of you may have read where Mayor de Blasio in New York City announced an initiative in December where uh, they're dedicating $4 billion over the course of the next 10 years to make New York City's municipal fleet the most environmentally friendly in the country. So what we intend to do is adopt the bi-coastal strategy, where we're going to bring the technology we're acquiring from EBI uh, to the East Coast and have the first really East Coast hub for excellence in, in uh, manufacturing of electric vehicles. So finally, uh, there is a, a handout I hope you'll take, a, take a, a, uh, with you, which talks about the 2018 truck and bus rule. Many of you know that the environmental standards, again, in California will take the next step in terms of emissions, uh, emissions requirements in 2018. It's not well known that between 3,000 and 3,500 school buses in California will have to come off the road. They cannot meet that standard. Now, there's only two options to get there. It's one, it's retrofit, and this is not an aftermarket particulate retrofit, which was relatively simple, but the, di the diesel engines, particularly the older, dirty uh, engines, will just don't have the ability, so they either have to be converted or they have to be replaced. Now, the reality is that, there's, uh, regardless of whatever uh, legislative initiatives may come about, no one's going to replace 8,000, I'm sorry, 4,000 school buses in a given time. So it's something you need to be thinking about planning on now, because really, the, where we are today, we are in 2017, because of the length of time for your capital initiatives and your long-term bonding processes. So these things are on the horizon. And the solutions exist to help you get there. And I hope that some of what we shared today would give you, you know, give you some sense of, uh, give you some sense of some alternatives that are available. And uh, I enjoyed the slide that showed uh, President Kennedy smoking. And it reminded me of my favorite President Kennedy uh, saying, and it dealt with the space program. And basically, in his speech that empowered the nation to go to the moon, he talked about how we do these things not because they're easy, but we do them because they're hard. So everybody in this room is in that hard business, right? It, it's financing, make it feasible. It's clean energy development. It's how do you set the stage for our school children? But I really think, of course, somewhat myopically, is where do we have a better opportunity to invest in and impact the thinking of our next generation than putting them on clean school buses? Kids that can go home and say, and say to their parents that they were on a bus that had zero emissions. You'll notice that our bus has green wheels, very ugly, green wheels and green bumpers. Why? Because as time goes on, members of the community can look at that bus and say, my kid's on that clean bus. Politicians, people who, who generate the money to make that feasible can look at it and say, I did something for my community. And the subliminal message is eventually that when they see the school buses with black wheels and black bumpers, they'll know those are the ones that are generating the soot, generating the things that make their kids sick every day. So again, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and share a little bit of our vision. And uh, we're here. I hope many of you will get the opportunity to take the tour and uh, take the ride on our electric bus today. Thank you.